My intentions this day were to fly from Richland, Washington to Salt Lake City in our Glass Air RG for business. The weather had been unstable. A fast-moving cold front had passed through the northwest the night before, and broken conditions prevailed during the day with occasional rain and light snow showers, but also with good visibilities and ceilings high enough to qualify as VFR. The weather chart showed the cold front was then located near Twin Falls, Idaho, so I chose to go around the problem and route my flight due south over eastern Oregon to Burns and Rome and to approach Salt Lake from Elko and Wendover to the west. Knowing that the cumulus clouds would certainly be full of ice, I initially chose to fly under the clouds in what looked to be VFR conditions. By the time I was ready for takeoff, however, ceilings and visibilities were lower all around, and it was obvious that I would not be able to fly under the cloud deck to the south. After takeoff, I climbed up to around 10,000 feet. Turning southward, I began my cruise, and as the tops climbed higher along my path, so did I until I was cruising at 15,500 feet above sea level. It was a nice smooth ride, and the winds aloft were giving me more tailwind than the crosswind predicted, so I was comfortable with the situation. I knew it was cold outside. I just did not know how cold it was. The cabin heater was having a hard time keeping up. I could see my breath in the cockpit. But I've done that before in other rented aircraft and endured it with no lasting problems, either for me or for the airplane. According to the weather briefing, however, the temperatures aloft were supposed to be minus 25 degrees centigrade. That's minus 13 degrees Fahrenheit, and that is 45 Fahrenheit degrees below freezing. About one hour into the flight, I began to detect the barest hint of a burning smell. At first, I was not certain whether it was an electrical or oil smell. As I was checking gauges, the first thing to catch my eye was the oil pressure gauge, which was pegged on the extreme high side of the scale. What could that mean? The high oil pressure reading implied to me that possibly the oil cooler had frozen and was not allowing oil to circulate. Without circulating oil, my engine was at risk of melting down and seizing up from friction, and looking around, I was in the middle of nowhere without a place to quickly land, or so I thought. Just then, a puff of oil smoke entered the cabin. I punched the nearest button on my Garmin 496 GPS, and it told me that GCD was 15 miles behind me. What is GCD? I thought. I don't care. It's got to be an airport. I broke left, and as I brought the nose around, I could see a gorgeous, glistening, straight black line in the landscape, visible through a great, big, beautiful hole in the clouds. Sweet. Trying to protect the engine, I pulled the power back to idle. With what I thought was a plugged oil pathway, the extreme high pressure must have found the weakest link, and the engine started blowing oil out through a seal up near the front of the engine or at the propeller. At least that's what the evidence seemed to say. I glided down for 15,000 feet at idle, or very low power, straight into the John Day Airport. About halfway down, seeing the abundance of trees and mountains around me, I dialed up the emergency frequency and called out, Mayday, Mayday, any station, Glass Air 391, Juliet Charlie, 15 miles southwest of John Day, smoke in the cockpit. By the time I landed in a 20 knot direct crosswind and shut the engine down, I could hear an air raid siren sounding from the town below. John Day has a volunteer fire department and the siren was calling all hands to task. Within five minutes and after hearing more vehicle mounted sirens, I had what seemed to be the whole police department and a fire engine at the airport to make my acquaintance. Nice new friends. Apparently, after talking to me, McMinnville Radio had contacted the local 911 dispatcher and told them to expect an airplane from the southwest that was on fire and inbound to their airport. The firefighters were so focused on the expectations given them that they drove right past me and my airplane and stood on the ramp staring to the southwest, ready to react. But I had beaten them there. When one person just five feet away from me explained to another what they were waiting for, I interjected, Do you mean me? I got no response. I repeated, Do you mean me? Again, no response. Then I raised my voice, Hey, I think you mean me. They all turned and looked at me. I then pointed to my oily, dripping bird and said, And that's the airplane. I think they were actually disappointed there was no fire to put out. I was good with it. 
So, what was the problem that caused the high oil pressure reading? A frozen oil cooler, like I had suspected? Nope. It turns out the crankcase ventilation pipe, where it extends under the fuselage, froze up in flight. You see, internal combustion engines need to belch. Cars have PCV valves and systems to vent those internal gases back down the intake so the unburned hydrocarbons get burned. But airplane engines have to breathe even more, so the internal gases are simply vented overboard. On our engine, the vent pipe is a rubber hose coming from the top rear of the crankcase, extending down to the bottom of the engine compartment where it attaches to an aluminum pipe that extends out into the airstream more than 12 inches before bending a little downwards. My mechanic has seen gases venting during our test runs. The combustion gases that blow past the piston rings do contain some water vapor and that is what was condensing to, to visible vapor as it exited the tube. That water vapor had frozen to the inside of the aluminum tube in the minus 13 degree air and plugged up the hose. And that would explain the high oil pressure reading. With a blocked breather tube, the interior of the entire engine w was filled with pressurized gases. The oil would be under high pressure no matter what. A pressure relief valve did. And then it's just a matter of finding the weakest seal and blowing liquid oil out of it. So what did we do to make sure this doesn't happen again? My mechanic drilled a small hole in the rubber tube before it attaches to the aluminum pipe. With this, the next time the breather pipe freezes up, the rubber tube will vent the excess pressure to the interior of the engine compartment. It may whistle like a teapot, but it will do its job.